It's been two weeks since a major stressor event almost crashed this tank. And in the days following the crash, you work to rule out every possible cause. But knowing that some causes will always remain invisible, you collected a water sample or ICP test so that a lab could take a closer look. You were sure this would reveal the problem until a few days ago when the results came back normal. Normal would usually be a relief, but in this case, it just made things more mysterious. Because if the culprit couldn't be seen by a machine using inductively coupled plasma, a machine that atomizes the sample, it was all but certain you weren't going to find it. So you took a new approach and began researching coral immunity in the hopes that you might learn how to improve conditions and speed up recovery. And very quickly, you were reminded that in nature, everything is interconnected, especially in the case of the holobiont, or the invisible world of microorganisms that keep coral healthy. Today, we're gonna explore this microscopic network with an emphasis on the roles played by bacteria and viruses. To do this, we'll be going deep, beyond the realm of the naked eye, and while things may seem strange and complex at this level, it's an inescapable fact that small things drive big things. And in order to master our systems, it helps to be familiar with some of the mechanisms we can't see. So without further ado, come along as we journey into the rabbit hole of the microbial kingdom, lifting the veil on the holobiont and the microbes that call it home. When you're new to keeping coral, there's a long list of things that can be perplexing. But among these, reading coral signals has to rank among the toughest, especially in the case of recovery, where progress can be subtle and hard to interpret. It's easy to lose faith given the subtlety of these incremental improvements and to interfere unnecessarily in the quest for a quick fix. Not seeing improvement you assume the coral needs something and start chasing numbers or mess with lighting, flow, or any number of other things. Meanwhile, this drives the nail even deeper as a vicious feedback loop sets in with the coral continuing to decline as you continue to upset stability. An example of what can cause this kind of mistake is currently playing out in this tank where some coral which looked better yesterday now look worse and others which looked worse yesterday now look better. In the face of inconsistent feedback like this, it's natural to question whether things are improving. But what might ring alarm bells in the new aquarist is actually just the result of what researchers believe to be due to host-specific microbial assemblages found in coral, similar to the way two humans have different bacteria in their gut. And it's thanks to these microbes and their associated genes that no two coral can be expected to recover on the same exact timeline, just as no two humans do. And this is why we sometimes see an aftershock or a coral going downhill long after the others have and even after a problem has been addressed. All right, so microbes and other members of the coral holobiont clearly deserve our attention since they're quietly driving many of the signals we see with the naked eye, even potentially misleading ones. So, in order to get a better idea of how this all works, let's take a closer look at the diverse cast of players involved. As we saw in part one of this series, the holobiont refers to the coral host, its symbiotic inner algae, bacteria, archaea, fungi, and viruses, that all work together for the benefit of what scientists call the meta-organism. You see, within coral lie several microhabitats, including the skeleton, gastrovascular cavity, tissue, and outer mucus layer, which each provide shelter to various members of this meta-organism. And as it happens, none of these microorganisms gets a free ride. In true Darwinian fashion, all of these microorganisms have a role to play, working together to maintain homeostasis. For example, 
Many coral harbor a filamentous algae in the pores of their skeleton, which can provide the coral with a backup source of photosynthetic energy in the event of bleaching. Another example is zooxanthellae, or corals in algae, which lives in the tissues surrounding the gastrovascular cavity, providing energy and oxygen to the coral. And in each of these cases, the tenants are also getting benefits, not just in shelter, but in compounds secured or produced by the coral. But among these habitats, perhaps none is more complex than the mucus layer, found on the surface of coral, where microbes grant immunity. Just like the human gut, this is where foreign microbes are held at bay, thanks to bacteriophages, which live inside this gelatinous boundary layer. Bacteriophages, or simply phages, are viruses that infect bacterial cells to replicate. And this strategy has proven so successful that they're the most abundant member of the coral metaorganism. Phages are very good at destroying cells, and in coral, they do this by binding to the surface of the mucus layer, where they create a deadly contact barrier, destroying incoming microbes that pose a threat. They're also adept at eliminating other pathogens that sneak through by using their power to actively seek and destroy anything that upsets equilibrium. And because phages are constantly destroying cells, they also collect bits of foreign DNA, which can benefit the coral host in what's known as lateral gene transfer. In this way, new traits are conferred to the coral's core bacteria, as phages alter the DNA inside those bacteria. This genomic plasticity is one reason viruses are so valuable to coral, since they can effectively adjust immune capability in bacteria by modifying genes. But phages can also work against coral. And this is because some of them switch from friend to foe, or commensal to pathogenic. Under ideal conditions, they can lie dormant, intertwining their genes into those of their host bacteria. When the holobion is balanced, they cause no harm. But when the mucus layer becomes stressed, virulence genes can switch on, causing the virus inside to destroy its bacterial host as it seeks opportunity elsewhere. In this tank, this resulted in tissue destruction, polyprocession, and generally unhappy coral. In cases like these, the reef aquarium hobby is known for resorting to antibiotics as a magic bullet. But after doing some digging, you learn that these drugs have the unintended consequence of encouraging antibiotic-resistant bacteria to develop, a problem already seen in captivity. So what can be done to restore the symbiosis of the mucus layer without helping nature create super bacteria? The answer could lie in probiotics, or the dosing of what researchers call beneficial microbes for corals. And these probiotic cocktails have been used by researchers for a number of studies, the results of which are pretty compelling. From halting bleaching to breaking down toxic oil to fighting disease, lab researchers have had success fighting all kinds of threats faced by coral. And while it remains a question whether these BMCs should be used in the wild, they could change the game in the reefing hobby. Out of curiosity, you do some digging to see what products like these might exist for hobbyists, and you find one targeted to dysbiosis, or disturbance of the microbiome. Apparently, this additive is a special blend of bacteria, known to break down long-chain organic compounds which build up in mature aquariums. This sounds good, but you have no idea what it means, so you find yourself doing more research to figure it out. What you learn is pretty insane, and you realize how much mystery still surrounds coral reefs. For starters, there's been a debate in the scientific community about how energy gets recycled on the reef, given that life-sustaining elements like carbon often get trapped inside complex molecules. To back up a bit, the element carbon is considered essential for all life on Earth because of the bonds it allows. And as such, it's a hot commodity. 
In what's known as the carbon cycle, atoms of carbon make their way through the atmosphere, into the food chain, and back again, taking whatever form they need to along the way. In coral, this takes place as their inner algae photosynthesize, consuming carbon in the form of CO2 and converting it into organic carbon in a process known as carbon fixing. This organic carbon soon finds itself trapped inside coral mucus, where it's secreted as dissolved organic matter. And this happens so much that mucus is one of the largest sources of dissolved organic matter on coral reefs. The problem is that DOM and the carbon inside it is just that, dissolved. Like tiny, really tiny. So it's all but impossible for higher organisms to see it, let alone consume it. Meaning that theoretically, it could just accumulate, causing more and more carbon to become locked up and unavailable. But, as evolution would have it, nature developed miniature specialists for this miniature matter in bacterial strains from this phylum, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. And the answer to the carbon mystery scientists had been trying to solve is that these bacteria are found living inside sponges throughout reefs, where together these two organisms use their unique relationship to close the gap in the carbon cycle. All right, so that was the rabbit hole you were warned about, and now let's skip to why it's relevant. Well, our aquariums usually lack the dynamic duo just mentioned, meaning they don't cycle carbon and other nutrients nearly as well. Because of this, compounds can accumulate and begin disrupting biological processes like the nitrogen cycle or coral metabolism. And this can lead to what many refer to as old tank syndrome, with a gradual decline of an aquarium. And while this wasn't the cause of this tank's crash, we know from everything we've seen that the system did experience a disruption of the microbiome, meaning the bacterial assemblage of the mucus layer shifted away from core bacteria, lowering immunity and flipping the viral switch. So to reduce the likelihood of this happening again, you decide to use this bacterial cocktail, hoping it will improve conditions throughout the holobiont and return the metaorganism to a state of symbiosis. You, however, are still in a state of dysbiosis, if you will, having found no surefire explanation for what caused this crash. So you decide to review the facts one final time. When the coral first crashed, you checked your water parameters but they were normal. Nevertheless, you did a large water change, drawing a sample of the old water to send to the lab. Meanwhile, the coral improved significantly in mere hours. To you, this reaction doesn't signal coral disease, which can persist in the face of water changes. It does, however, signal toxins, which can often be exported in as little time as it takes to do a water change. And yet, when the ICP lab results came in, nothing was out of the ordinary. Given how hard the coral were hit, this just doesn't add up. And you wonder, could the lab have made a mistake? But that's when, like a bolt of lightning, a more likely scenario grips you. Maybe you made a mistake. Time stops as you replay the sequence of events in your mind. When the report came in, you downloaded it to your phone. And when you opened the downloads folder, you saw only one ICP test in it. Naturally, this is the one you opened. But what if the download failed without you realizing it? And the report in your downloads folder was actually an old one. You whip out your phone and check the downloads folder. There's only one report. You open it, scanning, and are horrified to see the report you read was one year old. Quickly, you log back into the lab database and download the correct report. And bam, right away, in bold red, you see a toxic reading of the metal 10, a level so high 
it's surprising the corals survived at all. So how in the world did all this tin get into your system? Well, the most likely answer is that it came from chemicals called plasticizers, used in the manufacture of flexible PVC tubing, which you use the week of the crash to connect the chiller in anticipation of summer heat. But as is often the case in reefing, you'll likely never know for sure if this was the cause. But what you do know is that in doing immediate 40% water changes, you likely saved all your coral from dying, even without knowing the problem. As the adage goes, where there's smoke, there's fire. And in the case of microscopic problems like toxicity or bacterial infection, smoke may be all you're gonna get. If all your coral look terrible, don't waste time looking for fire. Just get busy changing water. Thankfully, 30 days later, you open another ICP report, this time the correct one, and it confirms that all the tin has been removed. In a month of water changes, the tank has gone from a level of 361 micrograms per liter to zero. And the coral are starting to look good again. You can't help but reflect on what happened. The tank was at an all-time high, the coral looking fluffy and vibrant. And yet, one simple addition nearly brought the house down. How could this happen? How could you overlook such a critical detail? How many people will unsubscribe when you admit this on YouTube? The answer is actually pretty simple. You're human, prone to error, and even more so when your coral are dying. Thankfully, you didn't panic. In fact, you did relatively little aside from change water giving beneficial microbes the conditions needed to restore immunity. And for you, this balance of tending your coral while also leaving them be is exactly what makes keeping coral so fascinating. Day by day, it comes down to the art of reading signals, and sometimes even recognizing when you're in your own way. Amidst our hurry-up culture, you're grateful you have coral to force you to slow down, to look closely. And you wonder if this is why it's difficult for us to strike this balance in the wider world. After all, we're zooming so fast towards our own goals, we seldom slow down enough to catch nature's signals before it's too late. So while it's painful to witness, it's possible that the potential loss of coral reefs around the world is just the wake up call we need right now. One giant salvo across the bow, a signal so epic, it can't be missed. Be good to the planet, my friends, and we'll see you next time on Coral Explorer.